Again, we talked about some of the biggest and broadest cranial bones. And again, cranial bones, these are the ones that encase your brain. So we have the frontal bone in front. Then you have your two parietal bones. Again, you have a left and right. And then you have the temporal bones. You have two of them. Again, you have a left and right temple. And then you also have the occipital bone, just one in the adults, and this is in the back. All right, so this is the thing. Like, notice that all these bones are joined together, and they have, they're not just fused together. Well, they're kind of fused together, but they have a line between them. And these are called cranial sutures, and this is one example. So you notice that, that this, these little lines between these broad cranial bones, well, these are called sutures. And where did they develop from? So what we see here is actually uh, develop, developing um, skull. So this is an infant skull. But you notice that this doesn't actually have a suture yet. So what happens as an infant and a baby develops? These bones start growing, and they eventually start fusing together. And this is what causes those sutures. So these bones grow, but it starts to replace this uh, membranous tissue. And then uh, you have the when they come together, it's like stu st stitching a suture in a when you're stitching up a wound. So it's kind of stitching the bones together. Now, what do you call these things? So these little squishy membranous parts, sometimes co colloquially called soft spots, these are called fontanelles, and spelled two different ways. The first spelling, I think that's what you see in Martini, and fontanelles, many other textbooks use the shorter spelling. Either way, I think the both spellings should be accepted, but again, on the lecture exam, you don't really get judged on spelling. Now, it's a sagittal suture. So what is, well, where did we hear the term sagittal before? Remember your planes? Again, you have your coronal, you have your sagittal, and you have your transverse, right? So the sagittal suture follows the sagittal plane. Again, this is why it's important to know those anatomical planes. So again, here we have the mid-sagittal plane that saw someone straight in half this way. And that's, uh, the sagittal suture is along that plane, that mid-sagittal plane. Now here we have the coronal or frontal plane. And yes, everyone knows that when you hear corona, you think of something else. But the Latin term meant crown before. So what we have here is the coronal or frontal plane. And again, how do you wear your crown? You wear it on the it's coronal suture. So again, coronal referring to that plane that's frontal like that. And then you have something. So there's no transverse suture. You might think, OK, coronal, sagittal, and then transverse. Well, not quite. So this one in the back that joins the parietal, two parietal bones and the occipital bone, this is called the lambdoid suture. And if you know your Greek alphabet, like if you're a sorority or fraternity member, you know what lambda is, or probably have to memorize the Greek alphabet. So lambda is this pointy looking Greek letter. And it's kind of interesting because, OK, sometimes in this picture, it doesn't look quite pointy, but it's referring to that overall arched shape. So some people, have it, their lambdoid suture is more like a lambda, but in this figure, it's not quite like a pointy lambda. But that's the origin of the name. And there's another major suture. There are minor sutures, but coronal, sagittal, lambdoid, and the, this is the fourth one I definitely want you to know. So this one is called the squamous suture. I know it's kind of weird because, like, okay, is this related to the epithelial tissue? Well, no, because, like, remember, bone is a connective tissue. But squamous comes from, like, a, I think a Latin term means scaly. So for some reason, they think this looks scaly, and that's the term for the squamous suture. So as you can see, this joins the parietal bone to the temporal bone on the same side. But the thing is about the squamous suture, for more advanced classes, you might think it runs all the way from this junction between the parietal, temporal, and sphenoid bone all the way back to the junction between the parietal, temporal, and occipital bone. But it's actually a little tricky. So this region right here is actually not part of the squamous suture. It's a very small suture called the parietal mastoid suture. So yeah, I think, why did I italicize that? It's kind of small. It's kind of hard to see. I think. But just be aware that the squamous suture does not run all the way anterior from the front toward the back. So there is a smaller suture that is between the squamous suture and the occipital bone. All right, so remember I talked about those fontanelles. Again, you're, these bones, and this is why I think your lab book says there are two frontal bones, because notice that in this stage of development, there is a left and a right frontal bone in this infant. But in adult, this ends up fusing, and there's no real suture. I mean, sometimes you can see a small suture in some people, 
but typically it's completely fused. So here we have anterior fontanelle, posterior, again, know your anatomical directions, anterior front, posterior back. Now this is interesting, so look at this. So this is why if you have like a newborn baby, you can kind of feel the soft spot by, and the anterior fontanelle is typically more prominent than the posterior. But what's happening here? Well, remember, this isn't bone yet. So the cool thing about this is that sometimes this can be an indicator of health. If this anterior fontanelle and this little soft spot is actually bulging, maybe that means there's too much pressure inside the baby's brain. Something like encephalitis or like an inflammation of the brain tissue or something we call hydrocephalus when there's too much fluid inside the skull. So what's that going to do? It's going to push out that little soft spot and make it bulge. On the opposite side, what happens if you have too little fluid? Like say an infant is dehydrated. Well, if it doesn't have enough water in the baby's body, maybe this, this little soft spot, this anterior fontanelle, will actually depress and sink in. Because again, if you have a lack of fluid, you don't have enough pressure to push that back up. So this is why it's kind of not only cool in development, but also it's an indicator of health. Now then we're talking about sutures. So let's do a call back to the different types of bone classifications. So you have sutural bones, aka wormian bones. And again, what do they look like? Well, again, these are sutures, so they're related to sutures somehow. But sometimes you get these extra bones. So again, instead of forming a straight or instead of forming one line, it actually does these loop-de-loops. So you actually have a little, these small little pockets of bone within a suture. And I found a better picture. So yeah, this is the way I think of it. I think of it as kind of like wormy in because it looks like a bunch of worms with all the squiggly marks in it. But this is so. This is the example from the Martini book. Again, what we have here is a single suture without any wormian bones. But in some people, it's not. Not everyone has this, but it's not really rare either. So if a radiologist sees this, they're not going to freak out. But what you see here is the sagittal suture. In this typical anatomy, you don't see a wormian bone, but you see the sagittal suture kind of bifurcates and forks and then comes back down here. So this is an extra bone here. And again, not everybody has this. And this is also very interesting because this person's lambdoid suture, it doesn't form just one line here. It actually forms a little like island. So yeah, wormian bones are kind of like islands in a suture. So again, if the suture is like a river, these are little deltas or islands that aren't in everybody, but sometimes they form. And these are kind of like, what should I call them extra bones? Well, not everyone has them. That's my main point. Okay, so the cranial bones, we didn't cover all of them yet. So we did cover the frontal, parietal, temporal, occipital, so the real big, broad, flat ones, or flat ones. Again, the most flat bones are rounded to some extent. Then there's the ethmoid and the sphenoid bone. So the ethmoid, you can't quite see it from the surface anatomy of a skull. So you can see parts of it peeking out. You can see some of it through the orbital complex where you're, or the eye socket. And you can kind of see some of, some of it peeking out in the nasal cavity. Now the ethmoid bone, it looks very elaborate. So why does it look very... The thing is that it's also very delicate as well. These layers of bones are very thin, but you also have lots of... It's very lacy looking. It has a lot of holes. I remember for, foramina is just meaning more than one foramen. But foramen are holes, and whenever you have a hole in a bone, typically something passes through it. So what passes through the olfactory for foramina? Well, when you hear the term olfaction, that refers to your sense of smell. So it's something that passes through to it through these foramina that relates to your sense of smell. And then you actually have something called the olfactory bulb, which is a big cranial nerve. So it actually leads directly to your brain. But this olfactory bulb sends all these nerve fibers past these olfactory foramina. So instead of a blood vessel, what you actually have in a uh, if this was in a person, you had all of these nerves connecting the olfactory bulb and these olfactory, allowing olfactory nerve fibers to run into the nasal cavity. So this is how you're able to smell. These olfactory nerve fibers actually detect your sense of smell. So this allows like your nasal cavity to trans or it allows these nerves to detect these chemicals that you breathe in and relay, hey, what am I smelling? What chemicals are in my, the air I'm breathing in through my nasal cavity? And then it relays those signals up into the olfactory bulb, but that's more something you get into exam three. But just FYI, this is just, again, foramina. They carry something. Something runs through them. In this case, it's nerves.
So that's why it has all these holes and why it's very lacy looking. And then Krista Galli. So that was an interesting term. So the species name for our, like those chickens you see, or if you're here on campus, you see are the Gallus gallus. And Krista Galli means like, it's like the comb of a rooster. So that's what it's referring to. Then you have a perpendicular plate. And then you have these things called superior nasal concha and the middle nasal concha. And so again, it looks very elaborate, but this is the way I like to think of ethmoid. So notice that it's saying the posterior surface. So say you could take the ethmoid and look at the back of it. That's what you're looking at right now. So I like to think of that ethmoid like, oh, if I just show you a picture of this. So I kind of like turn it to the side a bit. And to me, it looks like a really fancy, complicated E. So this is how I, when I first was learning this, how I was able to visually identify the ethmoid. If you look at from the back, it looks like an E turning 90 degrees. But again, if that doesn't work for you, you don't have to use that mnemonic. That's just how I learned it. Okay, so that now we're done with the ethmoid. Let's talk about that last cranial bone. Let's talk about the sphenoid. So you can see the common misconception when I was teaching the lab is that you can't see the sphenoid from the external surface of the skull. You can, but it's kind of... It's a smaller pocket, it's not as broad and prominent from the outside surface as things like the frontal, parietal, temporal, and occipital bones, but you can see it. And it is partially occluded by the arch between the zygomatic bone and the temporal bone. So this is a sphenoid bone, you can see it from the outside surface. And not only can you see it from that surface, you can also see it from the, the orbital socket or the orbital complex, so the eye sockets. You can also see the surface of the sphenoid bone. And what do you notice? Well, this is also a common misconception. When you see the sphenoid by itself, you look at all these and you think the sphenoid is very rough, but this is actually where it joins to other bones. So this is why it looks rough on these surfaces. But if you look at the orbital surface where your eye would not be held, well, notice that this is very smooth. Again, if you have very soft tissues in a bony socket, you don't want it to be rough because if that uh, that organ moves around, then that's going to grade itself against any rough bone that exists there. So this is actually why the back part of the orbital surface is very smooth. But this is what, so when you see the sphenoid by itself, like this, and I'm not alone in this, I kind of think it looks kind of like a very gothic butterfly. And so did the anatomists. They called it a lesser wing up here, the lesser wings and the greater wings. So I like to think of it, that's why you might see it referred to as the sphenoid is the winged bone. And from this, what you're looking at is like, say you chop, so, like, cut someone's head like this, and you look from the top of it. Now you're looking from the up, you're looking from above and looking downwards. And this is what the sphenoid would look like. And again, it, this is why it's kind of called the winged bone. So I think from this angle, it looks like a bat. Some people like the butterfly, some people like the bat. But either way, it's why they call it the winged bone, because it has these projections out from a central surface. And it's kind of like symmetrical, what we call bilateral symmetry. All right, so why do I also use the bat example? Well, well, let's like talk about a specific structure. There are many structures on the sphenoid, but one I definitely want you to know, especially if you're continuing on to fill 142, is this part right here. And this part is called the cella tersica. So you may know, what does cella tersica mean? So it's Latin for Turkish saddle. And I'm like, okay, what's a Turkish saddle? So I had to like use Google and I was like, okay, this is a Turkish saddle. I'm like, okay, it's a saddle. But I'm like, does that look like this? I'm like, uh, I don't know, miss me with that stuff. But it's just like, yeah, that's why it's called cella tersica. That's what it's called. We just have to go with it. But why is it important? Well, it houses a very important gland. And this pituitary gland, it secretes and controls many of the hormones in your body. Sometimes it's nicknamed the master gland. 